You're listening to a podcast from The Word. David, I put it to you at a point in life where you're too old for biopics. Oh, yes. And I think I might have reached that point. I just noticed that Jeremy Allen's playing Springsteen in the new uh, biopic about Nebraska. And Timothy Chalamet is playing... It's easy for you to say. Circa. Circa, the new Newport Festival. There's pictures of him all over the place this week, walking through New York in shades and a kind of... uh, Suede jacket. Supposed to be Bob I, Dylan. Yeah, and those those are obviously. I, mean, I understand that they're aimed at people who don't know much about Dylan and don't know much about Springsteen and do know a lot about the people who are starring in them and will probably go and see them. But my feeling is, what you're getting from biopics mostly is information. And if you if you're sufficiently interested in a biopic to be watching it in the first place, you probably know most of that information. And therefore, there's not much percentage of doing it. And I'm too old to be convinced that somebody is playing the part of someone I'm really familiar with. And also, I think that Get Back has changed my view of rock films. I'm sorry, it has. I know it's a completely different kind of film. But Get Back is about the creative process, and its level of revelation was absolutely enormous. And it's about the internal dynamic of the group, you know, and it's about songwriting. And the amount that I learned from that was so fantastic. But seeing somebody, having said that, you and I went to see Elvis, the Baz Luhrmann Elvis, didn't we, two or three years ago? Mm-hmm. It was very good. Mm-hmm. But just had really good live sequences, and Tom Hanks was really good as Tom Parker, and I don't know. What do you think? Are you too old for biopics? Uh, well, it's certainly the case that if they're making a film about Bruce Springsteen during the making of Nebraska, which is an extraordinary thing to focus on, really, uh, and if they're making a film about Bob Dylan, what you'd say around the time it's around of the Newport, isn't it? Newport Festival, it's very specific, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Um, they're obviously hoping that the people who flock to the cinema will be people who have only the foggiest notion, really, of who Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan are or were. Uh, and there's no reason why they should, really. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. The, you know, the, the, it's uh, obviously part of the reason for doing these things is to kind of keep these, um, keep the interest in these performers alive and and their cost catalogue and so forth. And it's also quite interesting, isn't it, that it it does indicate a kind of feeling within entertainment that if you want grand figures, slightly larger than life figures. You have to go back quite a long way to get them, don't you? Yeah, you really? do. You know, nobody's doing that about, I don't know, nobody's doing that about anything that happened in the last 20 years. Nobody's doing that about Ed Sheeran, are they? You know, whereas back in the day, the, the Tommy Steele story used to be an honor your cinema at the same time as Tommy Steele was still a kind of pop star. You know what yeah. I mean? It, that's the way it happened. It doesn't happen in, the, in that way any longer. So, you know, they won't be relying on you or me going along to the multiplex to to watch those films. You know, they've been relying on, on a completely new generation. I suppose this is what happens now. You know, when people pass away, the reality of them passes away and the image just takes over, doesn't it, you know? And that posterity, the future, will decide on a version of Bruce Springsteen or Bob Dylan or Marvin Gaye or Bob Marley or anybody you like to you like to suggest. They will arrive at a version that ap- appeals to them. That works in their in their world view that absolutely fits in, like the, Baz Luhrmann's the, Elvis, which is kind actual, of slightly woke Elvis, isn't the it? The actual reality of them won't yeah. matter at all, you know, because they're kind of their image in the end is it's kind of more enduring than the reality of yes, them. Really, yeah. they pass into myth. Um, actually, as an aside. I've, I've had something on my phone. I, I read this down ages ago. I make a note on my phone of little quotes. And I've been meaning, I was looking at them last night. And I went down and I thought, God, I've been meaning to, meaning to tell Mark that for absolutely ages. And I haven't got round to it, but I'm going to tell it to you now. Go on, what was it? This is a quote from Artie Shaw, the great 40s band leader who worked with Sinatra and Bing Crosby and all sorts. And Bing Crosby was, um, you know, his his image throughout his entire career was as this super relaxed individual who could reach a state of extraordinary serenity in the middle of the the maddest action. You know, the, the, the thing about Bing 
was he was madly relaxed. And Artie Shaw said, Bing is no more Bing than Bogart was Bogart. <laughs> I thought that was very good. <laughs> yeah, that all these people... It's a huge act. It's an act. <laughs> Beneath the calm exterior of the swan, there are a pair of feet frantically <laughs> paddling. <laughs> <laughs> and Bing, no less than anybody, by God, he worked at things, you know. All these people, they work at things like crazy. And it's, you know, what remains on the uh, on the surface is the thing that's um, that's remembered. I think I sent you this morning, didn't I? I don't know if you had a chance to look at it. There's a there's a terrific old documentary that's on the BBC iPlayer. And the moment oh, about Eric and Ernie. Um, Eric and Ernie rehearsing. I just saw the first 10 minutes. That's right, because it was Eric's widow died. Was it she died, died this yeah. week at the age of 97. Yeah. So she had 40 years widowed, yeah. you know, which is extraordinary. Um, but yes, they um, clipped them rehearsing, I think, in 1973. In, uh, they're turning up at a BBC rehearsal studio. Both in their Rolls Royces. Did you, you know? That's the- what I thought was interesting. <laughs> that, uh, you know, when we were kids, a Rolls Royce was universally applauded. Absolutely. You know, the cover of um, Best of Sellers by Peter Sellers. He's buffing up, isn't he? The, uh, Absolutely. The hood ornament of his Rolls Royce. It was good on you. Know, you. When John Lennon <laughs> bought a Rolls Royce and had it painted psychedelically, you know, he thought, fantastic. Anybody in a Rolls Royce, you just applauded. And then it was very working class thing to have a work Rolls Royce. Yes, I've made money and all that. It was yeah, yeah. fantastic. It's funny how now you saw a Rolls Royce, it would kind of your hackles would rise. <laughs> so I mean, there's something now that would just annoy you. It was just grotesquely vulgar. ostentatious yes. <laughs> and vulgar and uh, using you know, the planet's resources. Just, yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's funny how that's totally changed. It's totally changed. Anyway, the thing about Eric and Ernie was. How much they rehearsed. There they are rehearsing a 1973 Christmas special. And the amount of work, I, mean, I think at one point the producer said, well, we're pretty ahead of ourselves, actually. I think everybody should take a day off tomorrow. We don't need to be here. But yeah. Eric and Ernie still came in. Yeah. Can you imagine that? And their attention to details a bit really early on with the reading out original script. And uh, one of the producers says, and the uh, church bell strikes four times. And they both go, twice. Twice is enough. Be too long for, you know, their detail, the, what they oh, understood about timing and pacing and everything. is incredible. But it was all the result of massive amounts of work, you know. So, you know, the idea of that, that magic, you know, could only exist if they really, really worked at it yeah. in order to convince themselves that it was kind of going to be all right. You know, work was their insurance against it going wrong. You know, it's the old... I don't know, is it Gary Player, the golfer? You know, the harder I practice, the luckier I get, you know. Yeah, or, yeah. Or that kind of thing. It's all work, you know. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how we got on to that, but we're talking about Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan and the, and the film, the films being made about certain points in their life. I note also, it's 30 years ago today, 32 years ago today, since the release, the curious release of two Bruce Springsteen albums on the same day, Human Touch and Lucky, Lucky Town. Town. But I remember, I remember, <laughs> it's quite funny actually, the fuss that um, record companies traditionally make about embargoes and release dates and security. And, yeah. and uh, I had to review it for Q and... Uh, the only way to get to hear it, and I was very fortunate to get to hear it, I don't think most people did, um, was to go to, it wasn't even to go to CBS offices, it was to go to CBS studios. Yeah, maximum security studio. In, you'd be frisked for recording in Whit- devices. In Whitfield Street, in, um, you know, where it's just off Tonka Road around there. And, uh, and they had cleared... Obviously, this year it wasn't in use, but anyway, I was conducted yep. into this. It was a big old studio, big enough for you to be able to record an orchestra in there. You used to use it for a lot of soundtrack work. And I was put in the control room, standing over this really space-age desk, you know, I don't know, 32 tracks or whatever. And there I was, down, I'm there on my own. And the guy puts in, a tape, a dat, you know, D 
digital audio tapes, which is a way that they used to circulate those things in the days before the internet and so forth. And uh, put it in, and uh, and he said, well, I'll leave you now. And he went out, and I just pressed it to start, and I was listening to it. Huge great speakers, massive great speakers. And, um, and I was listening to it, and I thought, you know, this doesn't sound quite right. But I'm on my own. So I'm so on my own. Flicking little switches. Hold on a second, it. Mark. <laughs> Hold on a second. I've got um, no exaggeration. 10,000 buttons are in front of me, yeah. and faders and whatever. And I just look, I'm no engineer at all. But I noticed one, a little one just in front of me, and I thought, I'm just going to try that. What's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? I erased it. I'm not going to mangle the tape or whatever. Anyway, and I pressed it, and suddenly it sounded fine. And do you know what the button was? Mono to stereo. No. <laughs> yes. No. They, <laughs> they Sackable it. offense that the guy hadn't uh, sorted that out <laughs> for you. And checked it at all, you know. And so I, you know, I had to sit there and I think I might have listened to it three times or something like that. And I had to write something really quickly. So he listened to two albums three times. I had to write something really quickly. And I was more favorable about them than I should have been. Um, but, you know, that's just in the nature of reviewing. Uh, you know, if you're, and I was thinking about this this week, reading those reviews of Beyonce's album. Oh, yeah. Neil which, McCormack in the Telegraph was complaining about how he'd had to be up all night. Up all night listening to this and writing this for you, dear readers. But it was a pleasure because it's a wonderful record. Isn't it? and I, uh, but, but you said, I, I read that and I thought, Neil, fair enough. I, I, I know, I know you, you have your, your job to do and all that kind of stuff. But that cannot be a trustworthy judgment. If somebody has sat up all night and written it in a hurry, it can't be. You know, because you, you, what you tend to do is you come down on one side or the other. You know, Quite because early you, on, actually. Very early on. And then you're looking for ammunition to support that. Of course that you are. Oh, great, another terrible track. Or yeah. another great track. You <laughs> Absolutely. Know. All horns. Whereas we all know, you know, we've all lived with records streams, CDs, records, whatever, in whatever era. And we all know this is the truth about long-playing records. You do not know whether there are any good until 10 weeks later. Yeah. We have 10 weeks later, on 10 weeks we later to... when something just comes on and you haven't even intended to put it on and you go, yeah, you know, this is really good. And it, it's only, it's a, an accumulation of listeners. Is 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 what teaches those records you. that you lived with in an office when you were working on a music magazine? You played them every day, and you suddenly realised how fantastic they were. We had that idea on Key that we were going to run a thing about records six months after they came out, we're going to reevaluate them and say these are the ones that are actually actually really really went the distance, and these ones were a, a big disappointment. Yeah, and, very and, you, valuable. and you can tell. Well, you don't even have to have something as formal as that. You can tell with record or with anything. Whether people still talk about something ten weeks later, yeah, that's that's the real giveaway. You know what I mean? I, I've um, I've become fascinated by by uh, noticing when people don't talk about things. I think that's obviously off the boil. Nobody's talking about it anymore. <laughs> Whereas you know other things. And I was thinking about this. And uh, the other thing with Bruce Springsteen putting out Human Touch and Lucky Town on the same day. It can only have been because he wasn't really confident that either of them were quite up to scratch. Therefore, let's put out tons. You know, never mind the quality, feel the width kind of thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> but also, didn't he, didn't he very cleverly suggest that one had a certain timbre about it and the other didn't? One was a sort of A-side record, one was a kind of B-side record. So, therefore, you approach them with different expectations. But you're probably right. And now, that I, Beyonce record, that's the key thing everyone picks up on. How long is it? 80 20, minutes. It's 27 tracks. 27 tracks. Now, nobody puts out 27 tracks if they're confident about them, I don't think. I think, I think it's the opposite applies, actually, you know. You know, most, you know, how many double albums? I mean, I know that's not 
quite a, well, it's probably the same. I mean, it, that's longer than Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde, isn't it? Because Blonde on Blonde's not that long. It's not that it? long. Because Sad Eyed Lady is the whole side of, a, of, a, of a, a record. It's only about 12 minutes long. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all double albums are longer than they need to be. Is that not the case? Surely. Yeah, probably. But then you're very grateful for ones like, I think, for things, ones like the, the, the White Album. Because I, I think all the things that would never have made it onto a solo album a single album, are actually really wonderful. All those little throwaway things. Just well, all right, but that's the Beatles. You, but you can't apply the can't standards. apply the Beatles, the Beatles that's right. For that's anybody, anybody else, really. But um, no, I, I, was, I was thinking about Human Touch Lucky Town when I was reading all that stuff about Beyonce this week. It's, it's the same thing, you know. You've got a very limited amount of time to hear it, to arrive at some sort of judgment, and there's a huge amount of it. And therefore, the idea that your verdict will stand the test of time is, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty risky bet, it seems to me, but who cares? The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. It struck me this week that everything in entertainment nowadays... Yeah, broad sweeping statement coming up. Everything is simultaneously bigger and smaller. Now I can see you wrinkling, furrowing your brow. <laughs> You're wondering what I could possibly mean by that. No, I think I've I think I've got the gist of it. And You're talking about the huge, great entertainment um, series, aren't you? Not just, not just that. I tell you, there's loads of things we made me think about this. I think we discussed this not long ago on on the podcast. That the Arctic Monkeys were playing, whatever it was, it must have been last year at some time. I think they were playing two shows at the Arsenal Stadium. Yeah. Um, and it's like the Arctic Monkeys are clearly enormously popular but at the same time, not really very famous in the sense that I, I could walk past the Arctic Monkeys down my local high street and I wouldn't recognise them at all. Because they exist hey, entirely in a world for people who like the Arctic Monkeys. I'll tell you a really good example of that, Dua Lipa. When, Dua, when it was announced that Dua Lipa was headlining Glastonbury, did you follow this about a week ago? Yes. yes. A huge outcry from people who, this is people who go to Glastonbury saying, she's headlining, I've never heard of her. Oh, give well, over. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, But I thought that was really interesting because Dua Lipa again operates. It. Dua Lipa, I looked her up to see her, uh, how many monthly streams she gets. The most, I think, at the moment is that just over 100, 100 million a month is Taylor Swift, obviously. But Dua Lipa, I think, gets 77 million streams a month. She is absolutely massive. Oh, and of yet, course. And yet, you know, she can exist in a world where, uh, unless you're interested in, in, in her, you may just be unaware that she's around. You know, if you look back to the old days of top of the pops or whatever you were just and, and also just mainstream radio and and you know if there was a big hit you heard it didn't you you heard it, it in cabs you, you heard it in shops you heard it on jukeboxes in pubs uh you were just aware of its existence but there are an enormous acts now that uh, that uh, the people outside their their sphere have no well, it, of. It, it's streaming is does this because you don't streaming means that fame is no longer enacted in the public space. Yeah. You don't see it occurring. That's right. You know, one of the measures of, of um, fame or popularity in the music space used to be you saw it enacted in, in places called record shops. Yeah. You, you went past the window of a record shop and it would be full of the new album by so-and-so. Or you'd go in and there'd be a pile of Robbie Williams CDs or whatever they were. You know, it was a visible process. There was, you know, going back to the days of Barry Norman and John Ross, film releases were... You know, on television, oh, the new yeah, yeah. so-and-so so is were coming unaware, up. You were aware of the films, even the ones that you weren't going to go and see. Absolutely. You knew something about it. You've seen the trailer or whatever. Bookshops, all those yeah. kind of things. They were, they were, you know, arenas where you saw this, this being acted out. You no longer do. And so all these things are going down phone lines or whatever, 
and and the, uh, y- your attention is only being drawn to how popular they've become when you get a thing like the Arctic Monkeys doing two nights in the Arsenal Stadium or whatever. And I'll tell you what was the classic case of this, and um, Alex in the background will desperately be trying to join us at this point, this point. <laughs> is the Marvel film thing, you know, the, that whole world of Marvel films. Which is completely black and white, isn't it? You're either in the deep end and know every detail of it, or you've absolutely no idea what anybody's talking about. Absolutely no idea at all. And it's, it's never going to spread out of that, you know? It's, um, and, you know, this is kind of, it's kind of silo culture, isn't it? You know, yeah. uh, and... Um, it's just the it's just the way we live now. So, you know, that that's my theory for this week. Everything today is simultaneously bigger than you think and smaller than you imagined. This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. A follow-up to that uh, thing we were talking about last week about Phil Manzanero making uh, more money uh, th- than he made in Roxy Music out of five seconds of guitar playing <laughs> in 1978, sitting on his sofa while watching the television. She's just such a great story all about him being sampled by uh, Jay-Z and Kanye West. She says, a follow-up to that, Paul Jackson, and thanks very much for that, Paul, sent, uh, I think sent you, Dave, didn't yeah, he? Did. Uh, a, a link to a story about a, a Scottish punk group called the called the limps it's just brilliant and it's uh it's a story about how these guys who formed it, it, it says in the, in the piece is the limps moved 20 miles south to carlisle in the hope of cracking the big time but fame never came <laughs> oh, it's, such, it's such a great way of writing a group of aging punks have pogoed into the limelight this is from a scottish <laughs> newspaper so the idea of we, we go to the bright lights of carlisle in order to make carlisle. our fortune this it's, it's quite right, something carry on but they pogoed into the limelight after one of their songs was picked for a hit movie 45 years after it sold 50 <laughs> copies i love stories like this so this group the limps who consisted of uh, Andy Septic, the drummer Derek, who was known as DDT, very good. <laughs> Norman was Chuck Abnormal, and uh, who was the bass player. I think the lead singer was Thomas was, was Tam Limp. All bands had names like that, didn't they? Do you remember the Poison Girls were kind of you know Richard Famous, Lance De Boyle, you know, <laughs> Lance De Boyle. <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, th- th- this track, one of their tracks that sold 50 copies, had been picked up, a song called Someone I Can Talk To, and being used on the soundtrack of a coming-of-age comedy, Snack Shack, by the director Adam Rymier, I think it is. So uh, I love stories like that. I said, it's pit- not an enormous amount of money, but suddenly, out of the blue... This Isn't little it? windfall appears 45 it, years later. But as Phil Manzanera point, pointed out, what we talked to him about all this a week or so ago, you've got to be still there, haven't you? Yeah. It's the reward you get for still being there yeah. when the phone call comes, you know. And I did like the picture of them from the paper, the, you know, the four, four chaps with uh, close-cropped hair, shall we say, uh, in in their 60s or possibly even their 70s, you know. Sort of all all old punk bands look like that, don't they? They do, it really all gnarly. Those, <laughs> all those years later, you know, and one of them's a Labour councillor, you know. Yeah. And another one works in a library or whatever it was. You know? We were talking to Paul Cook, weren't we, this week, the drummer of the professionals um, for, for and a the, podcast. And, and the Sex Pistols. And the Sex Pistols, obviously. And he was saying the same thing. He says, you know, they played all these old, these old pistols heads turn up now in their 60s, you know. And uh, with their fading tattoos. Brilliant. Uh, I was looking at Bruce Springsteen resumed his tour, didn't he, this this week in the United States. And, of course, there is footage of absolutely everything nowadays. Then it used to be. It used to be a complete blackout on seeing what those things looked like or sounded like. But nowadays everybody's got a mobile phone out. And so there are the, there are the, the Bruce Springsteen, the E Street Band, on stage, strangely enough, none of them with grey hair, as far as I can see. No, the and they're looking out on a sea of of, uh, of people, fans, all of whom have grey hair. You know, it must be it must be kind of an odd sight. You know, if you're if you're on stage, you know that um, you know, like 
we always say that and when you when you get old you always think oh i'm still 24 but even though you know you're not you know but kind of people in rock bands sort of have to go on stage and sort of pretend that they are 24 don't they really <laughs> even in the in in the teeth of uh, considerable evidence to the contrary. Well, they do, and their and their counter argument for 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 why they dye their hair, if indeed they do dye their hair, <laughs> is that from the distance on stage they still look like themselves. It's what McCartney also used to say: "Says when I've got a collarless jacket on, yeah, I got my dark hair. I still look like Paul McCartney from 1965." If you're a quarter of a mile away, <laughs> 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 of course, one thing you can guarantee is nowadays the people looking are looking from further and further away, aren't they? All yeah. the time. It's a fact. Talking of age. So you were talking about Tony Blackburn. Tony yeah. Blackburn, what is he, 81? 81. He's 81. No, he just retired from, after I think 43 years of doing local radio. He's still doing radio too. Because he hasn't got time. Office. He hasn't got time. He hasn't got time to do local He's too busy. I, I, I've got to admit, I love Tony Blackburn. I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> I think he's absolutely fantastic. And you think of all those years of that kind of uh, Arnold and bad jokes and the cheesy disco and all that stuff that is, that's stigma that's attached to him you know he's kind of come out the other side of that now as, as, and and is genuinely recognized as a fantastically influential figure don't you think oh i mean well, amazing I, he, he was playing all that tamla motown and all that soul yeah. and stuff on national radio at a time when everybody else was desperately trying to play i don't know what it would have been the skids the, the, the yeah mud or <laughs> <laughs> the skids probably yeah and the, i the um, it's interesting if you look back and when I was writing my book about 1971, um, Bowie put out Hunky Dory, which did nothing at all, um, didn't chart. But Oh, you pretty thing was it got very little radio exposure, but it was Tony Blackburn's record of the week, and that was in the days when that meant something, isn't yeah, it? because the audience for Tony Blackburn would be considerable. I think when, you know, all the hype has died down, he's been the greatest British DJ for pretty much all his professional career for this simple reason, that when he plays a record, he plays a record because he likes it. Yeah, he likes and it. And that does not apply to the overwhelming majority of DJs. Yeah. And because they play things because the producers told them to or because they played the last one or because they think it'll make them popular or because they think it'll make them hip or they play it because somebody else is playing it. All those motivations come into it. Tony Blackburn's are not doing that No, at I agree. And also I think you have to point out that it was more challenging, it was much braver in his case to play these kind of... Um, kind of fringish records because he's playing them on national radio. I mean, John Peel, obviously, fantastic achievement. Everyone goes how wonderful it was that he gave all these people airplay. But he gave them airplay in the context of a programme that went on at 10 o'clock at night till midnight. Yeah, yeah. And it was expressly set up to try out <laughs> to experimental be music that would never, you know, to, to challenge you, which would never have been played in the daytime anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I do think he deserves some credit for that. And, uh, but I, I, whenever I see him on social media, um, in the middle of winter, if you if you wake up early and you go downstairs to make a cup of tea or whatever and it's cold and you put on your phone and you look on Twitter or Instagram or whatever and you notice that Tony Blackburn has just posted a little clip of him arriving, arriving outside, in the outside broadcasting house or Wogan house or wherever in order to just go in and do his programme. It's perishing bloody cold. Yeah. He's 81 years yeah. old. He's driven up from wherever he lives. Yeah. And he's so bothered about doing it that he records a little thing to his phone saying, do join me in an yeah, hour's time. Or, or whatever. I I it's fantastic it. <laughs> energy to keep on doing that. So, uh, you know, more power to you. Yeah, on his, on his 80th birthday, I remember he posted a thing saying he'd... Uh, Said something like, I've just come back from a six mile run. I'm going to have, uh, you know, a big family meal. And then later on, we got tennis. I think it was. And I just thought, that is just great. That's, the way, to get, that's the way to go on. The Word Podcast, walking the digital dog since 2007. I noticed that today, we're recording this March the 30th. Today in, uh, is the anniversary, is a significant <laughs> event in <laughs> 1978 of Paul Simon and Nikki uh, Hedden of The Clash. 
being arrested in Camden Town after shooting racing pigeons with air guns on the roof of their chalk farm studios. Do you remember that, Dave? <laughs> it's fantastic. I'm just looking at a little version of it here. It says, four police cars and a helicopter are required to make their arrest. That clearly didn't happen oh, now, fines true. totaled 800 pounds <laughs> i love that because I, I just it made me miss the fact that the music press at that time was th- there were lots of staple stories that just ran and ran and became have you mythical. have you gone back and looked at that story because i i remember this running for a while in the in, yeah. the, in the weekly music press yeah and probably not anywhere else at all but anyway the weekly music press i don't recall I may be wrong, but I do not recall at any point in the coverage of that story, either in the coverage or in the response of the list page, I do not recall anyone saying, isn't that a bit cruel to the pigeons? Do, do you recall any of that? No, well, they would now, wouldn't they? It would be an absolute <laughs> outcry. That's if the any first, of it actually happened. That's the, that's the first, first thing, thing anyone would say. That's the very first thing anyone would say. And, you know, they, they, it's, it's inconceivable that within a few days they wouldn't have had to issue a public apology. They yeah, just would. They would. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this to you, Mark. The Clash... If they issue a public apology for anything, I'm oh, no longer the Clash. The whole the whole yeah. deal about the Clash yeah. was we're rebels. We yeah. just don't care, you know. That's what we're here for. That's yeah. what we represent. That's why people still revere them however many years, 45 years later. It's all it's all about those kind of so rebel they wouldn't values. Have Ten minutes now, <laughs> they'd be dead. The truth. That's why. I know. That's why you go through the, you know you go through all those acts who are appearing at this year's Glastonbury. Where are the rebels? There aren't any. They, they, they've just left. They've left the building. They've been forced to leave the building by they the are, but, attitude of public censoriousness. But if you look back at that time when I was at the NME, there were various big characters. Bob Geldof was one of them. Bob Geldof, whatever Bob Geldof did, whatever he said was quotable, and he was in the never out of the papers. He was just really good value and really good copy. Boy George, a bit later on. Yeah, Fantastic, yeah. wasn't he? Boy George was the character that went from the music press actually into into the kind of uh, into the mainstream press yeah, Fleet absolutely. Street Fleet Street that was the person that made them realize that they all had to get pop columns and have daily coverage of pop He was the crossover pop. artist He was the though. crossover artist Boy George wandering about you know saying that uh, he liked sex but he preferred a cup of tea I'd rather Whatever he said the pantomime dame you know and I, I just it's interesting because there are no characters like that anymore and part of the reason for that is that nobody dares to be <laughs> outspoken about, about anything. anything. Because if you were, whatever Boy George said now about the thing about sex or the cup of tea or whatever, there'd be somebody would find some angle and stir up some kind of lobby that would make life difficult for him. And as you say, you'd spend your entire time being forced to apologise, which just yeah. doesn't work. No, it doesn't work at all. Now, it's interesting when you think back on these stories. And you know, the one I think you were you're remembering was when, was it John Mackay and Kenny Morris? Oh, yeah decamped from the banshees they left the banshees they 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 stuffed their pillowcases full of clothes supposedly <laughs> and left kind of uh, what appeared to be their sleeping bodies in the beds climbed out a back window and left the tour i mean i remember that running for ages i remember the story about jazz coleman a killing joke disappearing to iceland do you remember to escape the apocalypse yes, obviously there was some other agenda going on but you know yes. those stories just ran and ran and ran yeah. Kevin Rowland at one point stole the master tapes to, what was it, Don't Stand Oh, Gallery. God, yes. And, um, well, he tried to steal the master tapes and completely bungled it. Had a, a limo waiting outside, but when he ran out with the master tapes under his donkey jacket, the guy driving the chauffeur had actually gone off to make a phone call or something and left the car locked. <laughs> <laughs> But I remember those things as being really, really exciting. And later on, there was a fire at Phonogram and they thought that the master tapes had been destroyed. I mean, I'm sure very little of this actually happened. It's just really Absolutely. Good. You miss those things. I miss think, didn't Judas that, Priest have a, have a <coughs> supposedly have the um, the tapes that are uh, one of their they albums? They might have done. Kidnapped. They might have done. Yeah. You know, had to, <laughs> they were ransomed 
to yeah. be returned. This is the way that PRs used to just get stories in the music press, wasn't it? Yeah. And that was the important thing to do in in the weeks re- leading up to the release of an album. And the other great engine was that kind of divide and rule thing, wasn't it? Of to, is, to, is, to, is to pitch two acts against each other. Cliff versus Elvis, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Beatles, Beatles, Stones, Beatles Stones, Hendrix Clapton, yes. uh, Bowie v. Boland. Clash v. Pistols. Yes, Genesis. Yes, yes, yes and Genesis. Yeah, Clash cool. versus, yeah, then Spandau Ballet versus Duran Duran. Of Always course. Always against Blur. Of course. <laughs> Spans and, and uh, if you remember, they were on a, a, a special edition of Pop Quiz with Mike Yes, Reed. they were. It was such a big deal, wasn't it? Spandau Ballet, Duran Duran but together God, in the same yeah, room. I've that, yes. Yeah. My goodness. Are there still rivalries of that kind? That I I, well, there right. probably are, because there there's no music press to, to gin them up in the no, first place. It's entirely, entirely cooked up by the music press. Yeah. For obvious commercial reasons. Oh, I miss all that. Yeah, yeah. I miss those, because the great thing about those stories is they didn't matter at all. No, <laughs> remotely. Absolutely neither here nor there. Whereas the occasional... You know, when, whenever the music music gets into the so-called mainstream media nowadays, it's career-ending stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's really? P. Diddy, isn't it? You it's, know, it's God, you know. Which it, is a terrible story, but, you know, it, it, it only works if it can be measured by the kind of metric of of the mainstream press, which is mostly statistics. People get in there because they've broken some record. Oh, they have made vote. more money. They oh, have sold more stop tickets. It. That's so I good. refuse to read Because these. they have changed the economy of Northern Ireland by playing two concerts <laughs> at the sunset. You think, oh, this is ludicrous, you know. Yeah, yeah. Or because it's a diversity issue about, you know, whether they should or shouldn't be playing, you know, Glastonbury or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. We, what we miss is the simple days where people the days when the you could go with up. an air gun <laughs> and kill a load of innocent birds and nobody minded. <laughs> and with that, we'll take a break. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. Okay, we're joined by our, uh, our birthday guest, Andrew Newbury. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? Very good. When was nice the birthday? Uh, Monday, Thursday. Oh, ago. right. Okay. Okay. Were How there was celebra- it celebrations? Hey, it was good. It was a pub lunch, uh, some fine wine, watched a couple of my favourite films. Oh, a right. very nice way to spend the day. So, what is the conversational log you wish to throw on the uh, word in your ear fire this week? Okay. Oh, well, this is partly inspired by your conversation a couple of podcasts ago about divorce lyrics and divorce songs. And I wondered, are musical genres tied into lyrical stereotypes so for example you know country music seems to be dominated by the three d's drinking dogs and divorce uh rap music is guns money and hoes that's true <laughs> you know prog is goblins and the news of uranus <laughs> so i just wonder you know did would people feel uncomfortable if, uh, if certain music fell outside of those stereotypes? I mean, I think it goes, it's quite it's an interesting point because I think in defence country music, country music is about everything, absolutely anything. But every country music song has to have a story, and they generally start with the title. If you don't, you know, the the, the people who worked in the kind of songwriting mills of Nashville were legendarily guys who sat in a, in a bar at lunchtime and then wrote down things that people said that they overheard on cocktail napkins and then went away and wrote songs based on them. And I think that still holds true because you expect the audience to be able to recognise their life in the song. Whereas it's a mirror to your own life. It, it is. It's supposed to be yeah. a mirror to, to human life. And the thing that always amazes me about about uh, most popular music is how little it kind of reflects the things that people are talking about nowadays, because most of it's written by kind of anonymous professionals, it seems to be, you know, that, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the gender debate. Has anybody, is that, has that popped up in a popular song recently? Or it, maybe it has and I've missed it, you know. But, uh, but also, you know, you're quite right that the prog, you know, tends to write about kind of abstract things that are 
uh, considered slightly sort of too difficult to be in a basic pop song. Isn't that the case, Mark? Is that what it seems to happen? I think so. And I think, I think a lot is to do with the fact that prog, if this isn't too wild a generalisation, was actually kind of started by quite middle class and, and, and bookish people. I think significant tracks were things like Piper at the Gates of Dawn, the title of that album. Yeah, the very idea. Which uh, the idea that you associated with that kind of music, with with childish escapist literature, and then set the controls to the heart of the sun, which was about kind of space travel, and that then went sideways into sci-fi with Yes and groups like that. Mm. I think that was the basic foundation that that kind of music was associated with with imaginative thought processes and, and escape. I don't know. If if it's about that now, because I don't know enough about it, but that's certainly how it started off. My, my you... wife rather undermined this yesterday when I was telling her about what I'd be talking to you two about. And she, my wife loves prog. She's one of the few women. She loves prog more than I do. And she said, well, didn't King Crimson do a song about cat food? They did. That, yep. that defeats your theory. Well, okay, but that was, yep. to be fair, very much the exception that proves the rule. In, in the world, in the world, of, world of King Crimson, who don't forget their first album was called "In the Court of the Crimson King," an observation by King Crimson. Yeah, an, ob- an as observation. Danny likes to point out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we we got Alex here with us, Alex. Yes. What are the indie songwriting cliches? Because you know, you're the official representative of indie on earth. Indie correspondent, yes. Uh, well, actually, weirdly enough, I was thinking about this the other day because they seem to have disappeared, but certainly in the in the noughties, in the noughties which you could argue was, uh, you know, Land Valendi's peak, it was uh, it was escaping the 95 and, and the drudgery of the man. Um, right. Anything that evoked um, getting out of the drudgery of having a normal job um, was... It was about was, suburbia too, wasn't it? Yeah. The, the, yeah, I suppose the, the mundanity of small town life, living in stains, things like that. That was um, that, That's your indie trope remit. Uh, but I'm not sure that exists anymore because I think everybody's a bit more outward-facing these days. Mm. Uh, Oasis were all about escapism, though, weren't they? The sort of celebration of being together. So the Oasis songs were kind of about Oasis. They were. They They were. were. They were. To be in Oasis. Absolutely. (laughs) Having (laughs) it large. They were about (laughs) celebrating. And that's that's quite interesting you should say that, because they were the group who, huge part of their success was that their audiences could sing along, wouldn't they? They could kind of identify live forever and all that kind of stuff, you know, whereas the same thing wouldn't apply to Blur, would it, Alex? I don't think it would, would it? Blur were too clever for that. But the yeah. thing Oasis, what, they man- what Noel managed to do at his, in his prime was perfectly marry euphoria and melancholy. Like all those, all those early songs are obviously hugely anthemic and make people feel really, really good, like they're, that they're really alive. But there's there's a hint of yearning that underpins them all. I find, yes. especially when he sings them as well, they're kind of transformed by Liam's voice and his tone and his general persona. But um, when Noel grabbed the mic in the early days, at least, it felt like he was giving the songs a, a sort of a a more melancholy voicing. And, you know, that, that aspect of them was brought to the forefront in a way that Liam Somebody did. wrote a brilliant piece about them for The Word and described them as a rock and soul band, which I thought was mm. really good, actually. Mm. Oasis. Because they're a rock band, but they also they had a, a real sort of, certainly Noel's uh, element of it was, was uh, deep and, 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 and faintly philosophical. Yeah, so do they, I do think it's interesting to contrast this with something we were talking about earlier. Um, the Beyonce mega hit um, at the moment, which is a brilliant record, it's not about anything at all. Not for a second. It doesn't make any sense. It never tries to make any sense at all. It's a brilliant record. It's just a brilliant piece of record making. You know? Nobody is sitting there listening to it thinking, that's my life. You know, I need to have that record. Mind you, you could say that about Bob Dylan as well, couldn't you? A lot of his songs didn't make a lot of sense. They just sounded good. There, it's it's a fair point. Of consciousness is it's a thing. The thing with Beyonce's new record, it probably doesn't make sense as a whole because it is written by committee. And I think yes. the thing with modern songwriting is that yes. it's a load of different bits bolted together, essentially. Yeah. Saying, you know, um, so while it might, you know, it, it, it's a fantastic record, but it doesn't have the same, perhaps, have the same depth that something written by a singular entity would. 
No, no. That same stream of consciousness. You couldn't sit down and play on a guitar or a piano or whatever. I don't think it could be done. But the um, records did take you on a... I know what you mean about the mid-60s ones, but they did take you on a on a, an, an imaginative adventure. So you could, you could, they did inspire you to think of things. But I think Dave's point about Beyonce is you're not quite sure what it is you're meant to be thinking mm. about. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, food for thoughts are there, Andrew. Food for thoughts, and I'm sure other people may have their uh, their points of view, which they might like to share with us in uh, in, in future weeks. And uh, we just wanted we just wanted to close by talking about stag do's because Alex has got to organise one, and we think Alex is is a very unlikely person to be organising a stag do, <laughs> being this kind of senior <laughs> vegan. And uh, you know, how's it going, Alex? It's going well. We're booking a booking a spa day and. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> going, going, to, going to a juice bar um, book tickets to a club where ladies put clothes on <laughs> oh dear that's well I'm so glad, glad to see that tradition no, continues it, so Alex there's no, there's no paintball, there's no bowling there's none of that it's just I've done paintballing before eating and fake I, on I, sandwiches and, no, uh, well, I'm trying to avoid all the, all the classic staggy things um, so it paintballs off the menu. Might do something involving climbing and trees. That's uh, that's on the on the B list of things right. to, to organise at the moment. But uh, yeah, it's going to be quite a genteel thing. We're, we're a bit too old to be having it too large these days. Um, <laughs> so, but no, I'm deadly serious about the spa day. That is actually going to happen. Oh, stag party's still I'm a really thing. Really excited about it. Yeah, yeah, they are. It's still actually. a thing on it because about ten years but, ago, stag yeah, were a massive thing. They're not. My eldest son would be really. going on things for three days. You oh, go to God, Prague yeah. dressed as a penguin. Yeah, you, you go to <laughs> you go to Magaluf or something like that. Yeah, Magaluf. Know. And then even more terrifying, I don't know if any of you have been on there, had the experience of getting on an easy jet to discover that sitting three uh, rows in front of you is a hen part. Oh, oh my God. God. Girls in yeah. pink T-shirts, white cowboy hats and dealy boppers. Oh, oh, and a friend of mine was covered in green dye all over his body. It is stag do. And he had quite a serious job in the city. So on the Monday morning, <laughs> he was wearing his suit and shirt and tie. And underneath, he was entirely green. He didn't <laughs> manage to get it off his hands <laughs> and his face. Oh, That's crazy. God. Well, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say happy days, but I don't miss them at all. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. 